the future is about small intimate networks because loneliness in business is huge. And the loneliness in business is, is a very different thing to loneliness at home or in love. Loneliness in business has an economic impact as well because it's, you know, if you're not connected to people that think you matter, it affects your self-worth, it affects your decisions around your business, it affects the referrals you're going to get, it affects how you design your business, it affects your knowledge of how you should innovate your business models, you know, you don't hand down a critical friend to help you with things, you know, loneliness in business is terrifying and too many people are so connected, so, so connected, yet are really lonely. So I do think the future is about small intimate groups. I'm Chris O'Hare, your Quick Win CEO. As a CEO, I've run businesses, founded startups, consulted for others and even won awards. But in this show, we'll be talking to entrepreneurs and experts to help you understand key concepts for your business, along with three quick wins that you can take away and apply to your business today. And every week, we'll be finding out about the entrepreneur themselves and diving into a different but important topic. But first, imagine going through this pandemic without the internet. It's like a story from a dystopian movie. But we do have the internet and it's enabled you to talk to your family and see their faces, order food straight to your door or work collaboratively with your colleagues. And we're in a world where the internet has brought people together through tribes, but also created echo chambers. And these are the thoughts of Penny Power OBE, co-founder of Academy, the first social media platform for business established in 1998. And Penny gives us a glimpse into the rise and fall of a tech business and how she desperately tried to cling on to her belief that business should be personal. And Penny never let go of this belief and has now authored a book, Business is Personal. And we also talk about how technology has been used in a cold, unfriendly way, and that it doesn't have to be that way. So here we go, Penny Power. Thanks for coming on the show, Penny. Firstly, tell me the last thing that you read or watched or did that left an impression on you. It could be anything. It could be a Netflix series, a funny video, or a book that you read, or a quote that you've heard. Well, I do like my quotes. I do like them. I grab them on Instagram. I do think they're quite inspiring often. I saw this one. Freedom in any case is only possible by constantly struggling for it. And that was Albert Einstein. And I did quite like that. I love a good Einstein yeah. quote. That's a good he's old got, Einstein quote. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's quite interesting because um, that's the thing, isn't it? It's uh, you, you always feel like you've got to work hard towards something for you to be able to receive the reward and i suppose freedom is it's almost like a reward right that's uh, but we should we should have it as a birthright but maybe maybe not <laughs> yeah i just think it's really interesting because as you know i uh, the audience might not know but i'm focused on business owners and if you ask a business owner you know what, what are the three reasons you've jo- you you decided to have your own business freedom comes in majorly at the top Mm. And then you find out when you talk to them that they're not really free because they're, they've got clients they don't particularly like. They're working hours that they don't really choose. They are sort of become a prisoner of a business that's not really making them very happy. So then they're, they're not actually achieving the freedom. And they've created all the disciplines that the corporate world gave them because they can't they can't give themselves permission to step away from that yeah yeah that's that's so true um i always say to people if if you have to ask me whether you go into business you whether you should go into business don't do it because it's one of those things that you you have to feel it in your being and that 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 you just need to have that freedom because most of them don't realize how much hard work it is, right? And you create all these these rules and, and um, structure around your life that actually you think it's it's more free, but you've got so many more things to do. You've got the you know your accounts to do, you've got your legal side to do, um, and I mean to be honest, I went into it thinking that it was going to be far easier to create my own destiny, and and in the end, actually, it was it was far more difficult. It right? is. 
But also, I think there are, of course, we have to take responsibility for all the things that, you know, understanding our finances and putting all the different hats on. Mm. But, but the freedom around time and the choice of your clients and the business model you choose and all these things, you have more freedom than you realise. Mm. I mean, I've chosen now, thankfully, because of COVID, I don't tend to start work before 10 in the morning. And that's insane for me. I mean, I used to be... I, I just used to treat myself so badly. Mm. I mean, I would never have treated an employee in the way that I treated myself as a business owner. And, um, you know, now I'm, I don't mind working a bit later or just being incredibly productive and intense during those hours. But I've designed a business that allows me, I wake at five. Now I love my mornings, but I have five hours before I start work. That's, and that's wonderful. That's amazing. Um, but that, that's something I'm, I'm terrible at, you know, so I'm, I'm awake fairly early um, and I, all I can think about is work. <laughs> and uh, because of, perhaps that's the reason is because I love what I do and I love moving forwards. I'm that, that kind of um, overachiever type and I don't I don't get any purpose out of it. And, that, and this is why I don't think I could ever have a job, actually, because I'm always moving forwards. I always feel like I need to be achieving something for the bigger bigger picture rather than for someone else's bigger picture yeah so but i don't think i you know I, I do think ambition might change in through your decades and your drivers i do think they might change so i'm talking as a 57 year old woman who's worked and burnt myself out and worked and yeah. burnt myself out and done all of that but i just think that you know we can design a life and a business model that gives us more of a life and I'm very passionate about my work. I absolutely adore it. But those five hours in the morning for me sets me on fire so that during the next eight hours or 10 hours of work that I do, I'm absolutely on fire. I'm really ambitious. I really love it. I'm delivering. I'm creating. But I do a bit of that lovely time for me before it. I suppose I give myself more time in the morning than I do at night. Mm. Maybe you need you're, you're thinking about where your energy lies as well. So if, yeah. you, if you're noticing that your energy is better in the mornings and, and or the, the fact that you're kind of gearing yourself up ready for the day, then 100 percent. It's it's like um, for me, I'm always looking about where my energy is best placed at various points in the day. So if I if I need to do something more outgoing, the morning is always best for me. So I jump on Clubhouse in the mornings because I know that I can be quite vocal and I can talk a lot. Um, and likewise, if uh, as the day goes on, my energy levels drop. And if I have to do a podcast recording in an evening, you can noticeably see the difference between my energy levels from the morning to the evening. Um, and therefore, I try and focus what I want to do that day, uh, depending on my energy and where, yeah, yeah. where I know my energy levels are. So that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, it is important to understand your own energy and understand how it shifts around. I've always been a morning person. You know, I revised for my A-levels first thing, in, you know, at five in the morning. If I go on holiday, I'm the Germans. I don't have to kick the Germans off the seats. <laughs> uh, the seat first. You heard that. So I don't know why, where that came from. They always used to say on holidays, we go on holiday abroad. You've always got to fight for the seats around the pool yeah. with the Germans. But I'm, I'm down there really early yeah yeah the sunrise and everything so yeah so freedom for me uh, that quote means a lot to me because I just think in what way am I allowing myself to be free as a business owner and not have the manacles of a boss yeah. 100% so for me so it's a struggle you know that's why I like that because he says it's a struggle freedom is a struggle it is a struggle because you can't take it for granted and you have to constantly be working on how to how to achieve it mm. It's quite easy to fall into that that uh, routine and rules and regulations that you put on yourself, um, and that's essentially my business journey at the moment is about building passive income. So this is why I do the things I do on a daily basis because I'm looking how is this going to achieve my goal of building passive income to give me the life that I want or the freedom that I want, um, and that's what I do every day now. And that and I keep trying to remind myself, you know, is this working towards that goal of what I want to do? Yeah, brilliant. But, but thank you. Thank you for that. I will take that quote and I'll put it down in our library of great quotes because um, <laughs> I haven't heard that one before, although Einstein does do, do quite a few. 
But in your own words, Paddy, give me an understanding of what, what it is that you do um, and what your business does. So essentially me, I'm, I'm a business mentor, I would say now. You know, I've been a business owner for 28 years and I've learned a lot about business. And I think I didn't sort of decide to wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a business owner, a business mentor. But I think that's what's happened. I, and I love to mentor. I like coaching, but, you know, the differentiation is I get to when I with, when you've had a lot of experience and you can see the course somebody's on. It's hard. You know, coaching, you're supposed to get them to come up with all of the answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're a mentor, you've got your life experiences. So I like the combination of the two. And I deliver that either through people one to one. Very few people like that. Um, um, and through small, intimate groups. So BIP 100 and and our mastermind groups. And I, I love group mentoring and getting the, the group to rise together. Mm. So that's, that's what I do. That's what my job is. And, and obviously you're an author as well. Um, I can you're see the author. books. Yeah. So you, you've got this book, uh, Business is Personal. That's right. Uh, would you like to kind of give us a run through of what that book's about and how, and how you uh, define what um, a... What, what business is personal all about? Yeah, I'd love to. So I do, you're right, I'm an author and I also do a lot of public speaking, which I really love. And I love the fact that it's now virtual as well, because you can do a lot of speeches in one day when you're not traveling between them all, which is great. So the book, Business is Personal, I suppose is a philosophy. Um, and I like to attract people towards me that believes it's personal. And it came from the fact that I am very emotionally driven in business. Um, relationships are very very important to me and I like open people um, and and I just feel for me business has always been personal I don't think there's many things that are more personal than you know what gets you up in the morning what you the sacrifices you make for your business um, the purpose a sense of purpose you put into it I think it's very personal and it was interesting about I've always have felt that way but um, in 2012, when I went in our second business, uh, started Digital Youth Academy that brought digital marketing apprenticeship to market. The, the board, the investor that I had brought somebody onto the board and somebody who I didn't really gel with on the first meeting. I thought this is going to be a tricky relationship. And as we left it, she said to me, Penny, by the way, I don't have to like you. It's not personal, it's business. Wow. And we were walking to the tube when she said it, and it literally, all the way home, which takes about two hours for me, uh, this was just this mantra was going around in my head. You know, I don't have to like you. It's not personal. It's just business. And I was thinking, crap, I'm going to go into business and have somebody in the board who's basically just said that it's not important to her to like me and possibly doesn't like me. Um, and it really was a, an issue for me. And so it's a philosophy that I, I choose to believe in. OK, not everybody will. You still have these very dogmatic business people that say, no, business is this and this is me at home. And this is me on business. You, you know, this is me on LinkedIn and this is me on Facebook and never the twain will meet. But I think that life is very integrated now. And if we aren't, you know, our business gives us our identity and then we have our truth. And if we're not, if we don't actually combine the two and have our truth and make it personal, I think we're always battling inside our head and not really having the self-awareness of what makes us happy. So I went on a journey myself after a little bit of a shock that I had um, that met, forced me into taking some time back out, which I'm very happy to talk about the reasons. And um, I learned a lot about my character and how I wasn't emotionally tuned into myself well enough. And, and also, you know, I had been... Um, what's the word, uh, sort of being the person other people want me to be too much. And, um, and I learned that, you know, there's a very big difference between your character and your personality. You know, my personality does not need to change, but there were aspects of my character that I needed to learn about so that I could find business easier and put more boundaries around myself and learn how to be more assertive as a person, a whole series of things around my character that I needed to work on. Um, and I talk about that in my book and it's really is the journey of realizing that we can be I can sit here talking to you and I feel physically healthy but I could be physically fitter I'm talking to you and I'm mentally healthy 
but we can all be mentally fitter. And so mental fitness is a really important part of, of, of my journey of realizing that I matter and that I can, I can have an opinion about myself and I can make choices for myself. It's really interesting. And I think something you picked, you said there, which I'm going to pick up on is, is your drive and your motivation, right? So what's that thing that gets you out of bed in the morning? Because it sounds like it's about giving back. It's about giving love and teaching people this message about your book. Would you say that's the case? Yeah, I think so. I think um, way back when, if I look at me as a child, you know, we can always see ourselves. You can see the adult in the child, can't you? You know, it always, I always wanted people to feel like they matter. I think it's really lovely if somebody else makes you feel like you matter to them, that their presence has an impact. And I've always been someone in life, in school, that, did, that wanted people to feel that. And, and in business, it was always important to me. I remember somebody, one of my um, supervisors when I was a sales director uh, said to me, you know, when I watch you, you, everybody you talk to, they know that you are, that they really matter to you. And it's true. It's not a game. It's not a manipulation. It's true. People do matter to me, um, which is why though I've worked in technology all my life since I was 19, it's the empowerment of the technology, what technology can do for us that matters to me, you know, the humanity around technology matters to me and and so in business that is defined you know that can be defined in your leadership style when you're in business and you're maybe employed or running a business with lots of people or it can be defined in the way that you run a community um, online um, or offline and and so I'm very driven if you ask me what gets me up in the morning I'm driven to listen to people in the way that you're doing today, in the way that you do on Clubhouse, because I feel that when you listen to someone and you give them your time and you understand someone, that's important, then, um, then you're giving them something. And that's what I love to do. Fantastic. I think that's, that's really important. People don't listen enough um, in um, my eyes. Um, and I think it's it's that thing is you should listen and respond and be active in a conversation and not trying to force your agenda of why you're there or why you're doing things. It can be quite emotionally um, draining and your energy, right, in terms of, of actually being engaged all the time. And I understand why people disengage, but how, how do you get around that? How do you keep that those energy levels up? Is it that you choose the right people? To, do you, do you spot the right people? It is that. I think I have experienced people fatigue. You know, when we had a huge community academy, which we started in 1998, I, I definitely experienced fatigue. And in fact, I remember Ivan Meisner, who we know very well, the founder of BNI, um, so that we went and stayed with him in California for a while because BNI used to use the academy as its platform for its members. And, um, you know, years ago. And he said that networking had turned him into an introvert. Mm. And I think that, you know, you can be in danger of getting people fatigue. Yeah, you're right. Um, but it also is where your energy comes from. My energy doesn't come from books or technology per se or processes. It comes from people. And, and but in a gentle way, not from a people you know, running a community of 650,000 people that we ran with the Academy was exhausting. You know, we, my energy comes from one-to-one -one time with people or small groups because you see the energy in the group then, you don't, you know, so yeah, I, I just, I just love people. I learn everything from people. I hardly ever read a book. Um, I just learn everything from people. It's my thing. I just love people. I think that's really important that you've identified that um, and, yeah. and, uh, and you, you work towards that. It's, so, it's definitely something that I'm learning about now, you know, considering I, I've run an agency before um, and I learned that that wasn't my career path that I wanted to take. Um, and actually there's other things that I get energy from and there's other things that I want to do with my life. Uh, I, I think it's, really important for people to identify that and to and to 
follow that feeling of where they belong or where their energy comes from. Yeah, I think so many people find themselves on a path in business where they've designed something that's just not them and you've gone through that yourself and you're lucky you did it at a relatively young age and you had that self-awareness. And I think, you know, perhaps in my generation, and it's maybe one of the benefits of the more the millennial generation, in our generation, that self-awareness was seen as self-indulgence. And, and, and now you serve the world better when you're in your own flow. It's not selfish. It's just the better way to serve it. And I serve the world better by designing a business model that's right for me. I would prefer to have impact on 100 people than run a machine of 650,000 people. You know, and I'm serving those 100 people and those 100 people by them being strengthened can go on and serve more people and uh, it's just it's just for me a better a better way of doing it for me you know and i think this is why business is personal because the business model that's right for me doesn't necessarily have to be right for someone else but there's a real psychology around what is right for us in business and for me technology when i touch a keyboard i'm not touching the energy that's flowing through my fingertips is from my heart not my brain Whereas somebody else, their energy will be coming from their brain. Mm. Uh, and it's just, where does your energy flow? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So the humanity of these networks and the systems and the internet really matters to me deeply. So why did you choose 100 people for your Bit 100 Club? What, what was it that, obviously there's a personal element to it, but why, why 100? Um, so that is a really good question. So when we decided, so BIP stands for business is personal for anybody that's wondering why that's the title of the book, my philosophy. And when we were designing it, you know, how do we create an internet community again? Um, I started to go into a little bit, it triggered some panic in me when we were talking back in the spring last year, because it was taking me back to some of the real traumas that the Academy gave us with trolls, with trying to keep people happy um, the responsibility of um, people who don't share the same values. Um, it, it just, I could feel this sense of panic in me again to go back to that. And I think, you know, what was that saying? You know, the a definition of stupidity is to do the same thing and expect a different result. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, and then I just said to Thomas, you know, actually, if we look at the business model and what we're trying to achieve from this, I would prefer to serve 100 people and charge what we charge and give them a more exclusive experience than to serve 10,000 people and charge them probably a lot less. And ultimately the income that we generate would be the same. So 100 people paying 249 pounds a month is 25,000 pounds a month as a business model. Obviously there's a lot of costs in it, a lot of hidden costs that our members wouldn't realize. There's a lot of costs in it. Um, but that would that that generates a better lifestyle for us than two and a half thousand people or twenty five thousand people, and so it suited us that. So one hundred, I feel I you know when when I started Academy in nineteen ninety eight, which for anybody that's listening that they can Google it, but it was the world's first social network for business in the world. So there was MySpace and Friends United around, and I said to Thomas on the seventh of February, sitting in a Pizza Express, Thomas is going to be so many people who are lonely in this internet world and disconnected. And Thomas is a business owner at the time. I was not really working very much. I had five, three children under five and I was doing a bit of project work for some companies, but essentially not working. And um, I said, I'd really love to create a friendship network for business people to, to, to just to be friends, not to sell to each other, just to be friends. And he said, that's a great idea anyway. We then started it and I got some investment accidentally. And then it grew and it grew and it grew by power of mice, you know, the word of mouse. And um, and, uh, and it then became, I call it my accidental entrepreneur moment, because then it became this huge machine. And it wasn't what I set out to achieve. Uh, and it's phenomenal. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm proud of what the goodwill that we still have across the world from it. And I'm proud when people write and say, I learned how to behave online because I started in the academy 
I started as a friend and I now maintain that attitude of friendship um, online. So there's loads I'm very proud of, but running a machine that put us into two million pounds of personal debt and all of the roller coaster it took us on and the expectations of us and the 17 trolls that we had who we banned and then became these terrifying creatures outside of our network towards us. Mm. That's not what I set out to design and that's not me. And I didn't know intimately 650,000 people, but they knew me and I used to find it so insincere when somebody would say, oh, hi, Penny, walking through a tube station or, you know, I'd go to an event and I think, I know I'm supposed to know who you are and I don't. And I'd feel so insincere about that. So a hundred people, you know, Chris, we've only just met, but I feel like I can really get to know you. So it's yeah, beautiful. and I do think the future of I think the future is about small intimate networks because loneliness in business is huge and the loneliness in business is, is a very different thing to loneliness at home or in love loneliness in business has an economic impact as well because it's you know if you're not connected to people that think you matter it affects your self-worth it affects your decisions around your business it affects the referrals you're going to get it affects how you design your business it affects your knowledge of how you should innovate your business models you know you don't hand down a critical friend to help you with things you know loneliness in business is terrifying and too many people are so connected so so connected yet are really lonely so i do think the future is about small intimate groups yeah 100 percent. i mean there was a there was a quote from your book um you know where you're talking about the the promise of the internet was one of deep connection the reduction of loneliness and the joy of global kindness and friendship between business owners and the new social wave was not social at all it was about who could shout manipulate and win the most followers and no wonder it was really the birth of fake news dopamine driven systems that cause addiction suicide stress and depression in the young and the old mm -hmm. i mean that that says everything and then you go on to talk about, and, and there's another quote in your book, you know, I believe the connected world's a force for good, yet we are part of this transition from an unconnected world to a connected one, and we cannot expect a revolutionary shift in the global economy, economy to be easy or painless. And that's another one that I really resonated with me, with me because it was um, something about the fact that you had these trolls in your story, and and they were they were trying to keep you back in the old world. They were trying to keep you back... Uh, elsewhere and yet you had to suffer that pain and I'm sure there was there was other you know pains and as a world and, and I think you you mean a part of this statement is that there's other things that are happening as we're going through this journey together as humanity and we're really struggling with would you like to kind of comment on some of the other pains that you had through academy that kind of really resonates with that particular quote yeah, I, I think there was so many and I'm trying to think it relevant to other people. Um, what was beautiful about Academy, if I start with that, is that I wanted to do psychology at university. I had a place to do psychology at university. And then in the gap year, I went into the IT industry and it was in 1983. It was on a wave. It would have been madness to leave it. And I built an incredibly successful career in it. But people have, has always interested me and the psychology of people. And here we did, we had an experiment almost going on where we could watch people come in and build their brand and leave or stay, okay? And it was always the really noisy ones that would come in, very testosterone driven, very broadcast driven. They would make a lot of noise. So they would say, I've got to know so many people but they would burn out really quickly and they'd become ashes because people, they just made too much noise. It was all about them. And, and then there were the people who, um, somebody once referred to this type of person, the confident introvert that would come in gently, be more interested in listening and getting to know people calmly that would just stand the test of time and their businesses would just keep growing because people knew who they were, trusted them, got a sense of their skills and their value, and they just became this silent force that was the foundation of the academy. Um, so in terms of, so that was beautiful to watch. What was so tough was the responsibility of that. 
you know, Mark Zuckerberg, less so Reid Hoffman, who obviously passed LinkedIn on to Microsoft, but anybody that runs a big network has, you do have a responsibility for the culture of the network and not just the culture of this is how we behave in it, but also the climate, which is this is how it feels when you're in it. Does it feel warm or cold? So if I'm in LinkedIn, it feels cold to me. Mm. But it's a network. When I'm in BIP100, for example, or somewhere where I know I matter, it feels warm, right? So that's the climate of it. And then there's the culture of how do we behave towards one another. That's where I believe the real promise of the internet lies is within this a beautiful culture of kindness and friendship and everything. People started to say, well, the academy is very cultish. It's a culture you're creating, right? Mm -hmm. And other people would wear the badge of price and just by calling themselves, they, they adopted this word, I'm an academist. It's like within BIP, people have adopted this word, I'm a BIPA. It's if, if when you start to, people start to adopt a word that's a noun for who they are in it, you know people have got a sense of belonging as opposed to I use this network, I use LinkedIn, I belong to this network. Sense of belonging is when you get that true sense of community. So the painful part was keeping hold of that because we were more interested in keeping hold of that than we were about making squillions and becoming this massive social network. But, you know, like anyone, you get into this terrible, we fell down this chasm because on one hand, we wanted to keep hold of that culture. On the other hand, that's not what people will, most the majority of the world understood or wanted. And so the other side of the chasm was the LinkedIn's where people could say, I'm just going to stay in the what I am. This is, this is what I am. And oh, you get then got to the stage where um, some business owners would say, you'd go and meet them and they'd say, well, I'm on LinkedIn, but I've joined Facebook. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm so cool because I've become a friend on Facebook. They would never let the two come together. Whereas the Academy sat in between it, which was, this is about friendship in business. Mm. And that was, so the biggest, biggest and toughest and most painful part of it was maintaining the culture and without looking dictatorial and without looking like you're an autocratic leader that's saying you have to behave like this mm. we had to try and manage it and so you know we enable people to complain about people to highlight stuff to tell us when things aren't right but then when you do that that becomes very subjective right and right. so we're then managing all of these complaints um, but then there were some that were so recurring of the same person. And then you then we would facilitate a meeting with that person and say, look, Jim, or look, Mitch, or look, Sarah, or I could list all the names. I'm going to give you their surnames and say, and we really, rather than just chuck them out, we really tried to make friends with them. But ultimately, an asshole is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I got really caught up in because I... They wanted to be in this community. It was they were feeding off it themselves. It was it was, and they had their blogs and they had their stuff. I didn't want to chuck them out of the only pub in town and say, I know you're an alcoholic, but you're not allowed to come in here for a drink. And what we ultimately had to, and as soon as that happened, um, some press went against us. We had some horrible journalists, and and then it became really depersonalized that we became these people rather than Penny and Thomas that just building something of love hmm. it's really interesting um there's there's a few points there that you know I, I can imagine feel the pain of what you were going through because um you had your vision and you wanted to keep that vision yet you had all these um competitors coming up doing what they did in very specific ways um and probably where they were as well really helped i'm assuming you know where they you know you're very much a british company and they're in america and and that really took off. So they rode that white wave of, of growth. Absolutely. And LinkedIn, you know, Reid Hoffman was on our platform. I'm not saying that everything he did was down to us, but he had a case study as he's pitching for his investment. So, you know, it's not always easy to be the first. Mm. Um, but ultimately, we believed if people pay a small amount, £10, $10 or €10, Euros, to um to this which means they have to give their credit card which means they have to verify that they are who they are yeah then there's going to be an honesty inside this network 
And also, if they do that, then we don't have to get sponsors and people to pay for advertising and interrupt people. And so our members didn't have to become the product. Mm. And we didn't want to turn, we had to let go of our values to keep our business going where, oh, we've let all these free people in and now, oh shit, are they, are they who they say they are? And is that a fake person? And that person's abusing them and that, but we had to go free. Mm. And then you go free, you get more people and even the free people have expectations of you. So you're then serving people for free. Free people asking me for a one-to-one and a coffee. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to look like this is a class, class-based class society that, you know, well, you pay £10, you don't, so I'm not going to talk to you. It just became a real head fuck. Mm, I can imagine. Yeah. It's, it, that's always the case with um, free software in general. So, you know, in business you have this especially in in software um which is what i do most days is that you have this option you go down the freemium route where you offer something for free but you're also offering a load of service and and help um a part of that when as a business when you're first starting up that's really tricky right you can't you can't give all your time away so you need to go straight into something that's a bit more um a bit more paid in terms of what what it is that you're offering so completely understand where you're coming from with that but you also talk about how you wanted to keep that personal touch to it and which as a platform the best way of doing that was was the fact that you took payment to make sure that people were real and honest and and everyone was there for a reason Um, but what do you think technology as a whole makes it quite cold or impersonal is it the fact that it's a broadcasting platform or would you say um you know and, and people are not connecting because they want to connect or they just see it as a big signpost um platform or do you would you say it's just the way that humans are using it would you say it's the technology itself or would you say it's the way humans are using I'd say it's the way that humans are using it and i don't blame them for that i mean if you look at the majority of business owners you get a certain percentage that are just testosterone driven business people they're just even if that business failed they'll start another one and they'd be brilliant or that business succeed and they start another one and you know you get those people just Mm. and they will just use these systems um and they come out with all i mean i've seen loads of them come out with all you know people like you know i'll turn you into a six-figure millionaire overnight crap that you hear and they've just worked out a system and they go for all the lost souls that just don't know what else to do. And those people get sucked in. And, and then you get people who are building brilliant businesses, but those people aren't, they're not seeking to engage in the business. They're not seeking to engage with their platform. Um, they, they are very clever. Their values are not my values. Uh, they're very driven by uh, just getting that 999 or whatever it is out of everybody they're not they're not where I'm coming from and I don't want to look like I mean I'm sounding very judgmental here but that is their choice of business model and we as fodder for those people have to understand and and be realistic about what we expect from that that world um my hope is that most people start to realize that this is an ability to connect and learn and share with the most phenomenal amount of diverse people around the world Um, so like in bit bit 100 we say the diversity of expertise the commonality of kindness is something I say around I love diversity in every single way it's the only way you innovate and learn Um, so how do we use it you know a lot of people are very confused about they think they need to build these big brands right I've got to build a big brand and then for that would equate into likes and follows and that will equate into more customers And they build a big brand based on, look how brilliant I am. Let me tell you how much I'm achieving. Look at this award I've achieved. Look at this I've achieved. Look at this. That actually doesn't land at all well with any of us. Everybody can go, oh, I'm so happy. Congratulations. But where is the impact that that person is having by saying, I've won this award? It's zero impact, apart from actually probably making quite a lot of people feel pretty shit. (laughs) It's it's when people realise that their written word has so much impact and it can be negative or it can be positive and i would hope that most people want to have positive impact on people 
a positive impact comes from. How can I write something and resonate with the people that I want to serve that shows them that I understand them and I'm helping them on their life journey in whatever way? And when you read that and when you follow people like that, then they deserve great success. And then this is a wonderful place to be. It's a very it's a wonderful library of humanity. But unfortunately, this is still relatively new. It's still, you know, tw 22 years since Thomas and I started Academy and we were the first. This is a very new world. To some people, it feels like a lifetime. To millennials, they can't imagine a world maybe without it. Mm -hmm. But it is still new. We're still really learning. And it is creating massive mental health issues. And then it's not being really understood. Um, and it is changing humanity. And there is a responsibility of where the wealth sits to create these machines. And if it sits in people that don't share my purest view of can it not do positive Tim Berners-Lee? So Tim Berners-Lee, this is not what he wanted, what's been created. And so we can only be the change that we want to be. And so each of us, anybody listening to this, some people will say, bloody hell, no wonder Academy didn't survive. What, you know, what a fluffy, fluffy old bag she is who's talking about this. <laughs> right? The hard-nosed people. Other people will say, gosh, it's a shame it didn't survive. And actually, I do believe if I had the balls to start Academy now, we're in a time when people want that. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you're not always around, though, when, when you know, you need to set the path, learn your lessons. And then when actually you could have been successful, the, the world wasn't ready then, but they probably are now. And that's why Clubhouse is probably taking off, because it's creating this these tribes of people right that that people are then listening instead of yeah. um absorbing um what these all these perceived influencers uh, are spouting you know these fake unrealistic expectations and making people feel um i would say unworthy in, yeah. in their own lives and their own selves and, and what you're saying about you know you should only portray to the world what you value and what you love and what you want to help other people with um, that's quite an important part and that's that's how you should move on with the internet that's how you should treat the platform but that's tricky isn't it, it is it's tricky I don't and it is tricky because it is a game you know when I authored my book I was told right to be and to be able to call yourself a top a best-selling author right contact all your friends and ask them to buy it for 99p at a certain day at a certain time and then you the algorithm shoots you up and you can then say you're a best-selling author i didn't know I that. Just, it's just rubbish mm. just absolute rubbish people that win awards now i'm the, you know i'm entrepreneur of the year awards they've done it based on how big their network is that they can say could you vote for me it's, it's just these things I don't think, and you can either opt into it or not, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, I choose not to, because, because I, live, I live, and it sounds very spiritual, but I live in my own truth. I couldn't say to you, I'm a best-selling author, Chris. I couldn't, I'm not. I'm not. A few thousand people have read or listened to my book, and hopefully few of them have had something special from it, but I'm not a best-selling author. Mm. and so mm. I could never say that and I think we need more of that in this world because unfortunately like I said it creates un unrealistic expectations but especially when the younger generations um, start to look at these influencers and they see that they are they're formulating their world view around these people but not only that they they feel like I said before, unworthy, but also they're stopping them from doing certain things. So if you look at like a lot of the Generation Z um, people coming from school, they're, they're having less relationships because they don't they don't feel like they're worth dating or they're so insecure about themselves. Um, I don't know if you've seen that Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma, but that was a big smack in the face um, when I watched that. Have you it seen terrifies it? terrifies me. I know. It's terrifying. And I know we can't fight the direction we're going in. I watched Years and Years was another program that absolutely terrified me. Some people mm. sick. 
we can't and there's some certain realities that are happening now that you think my god you know we are we locked down for a year i mean there's certain realities mm. that we're all pretty shocked by when you actually think because it's become normal to us but actually it's insane and it's mm. the same with social media we think it's the norm but it's not it this is not the norm social media does not have to be our norm mm. um and i and i think it is a, a it's a huge problem in in um in the mental health of people um is i don't know last night ronan what's it called ronan kemp was did a brilliant show about mental health in men and a friend of his could suicide ronan kemp's a BBC radio presenter. Um, it was brilliant. And he said this, I think there might be a hashtag about it because he said always ask twice. So, uh, so I think hashtag ask twice. I don't know whether it's got going, but I think it should. Because he said, you know, we don't ever really allow ourselves to get into the detail with our friends anymore. We say, how are you? Oh, I'm very well. And he said, then say, how are you? Ask twice. Well, actually, da -da 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 -da. And um, I think social media has made everything superficial, and super, it's just we've got to learn to to deepen our relationships with people. And I learned the other day from somebody told me that relationship is uh, comes from the Latin to reveal. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I didn't know that. I know. So basically, you're opening up your feelings yourself. To have you're a relationship yourself. you're properly revealing yourself mm. and not many people have got relationships online with so how how can we change that other than demonstrating to the world what we want to portray um and showing them the real selves how else can we use technology tools to, to get out there and, and make a difference um how do we make make it more personal and, and other, other than the likes of Clubhouse, which we know is taking off um, because people feel like they're really getting to know someone. Yeah. Is there any other ways, you think? Well, I think we have to remember that we're not just money-making machines. It's not what we've been put on this earth for. And, of course, when you're in scarcity, financially, you're often in scarcity of time as well. And therefore, the concept of having conversations with people that aren't going to necessarily be your client is it puts people into stress because they say I haven't got time for that right um, and I know that feeling I know that feeling you know that if I'm if somebody I want to make sure that anybody that wants to talk to me could potentially be a client I mean that's it makes business sense with my time let's be productive with our time but you know LinkedIn there are human beings for example on LinkedIn who want to have conversations and I think one of the things that's lockdowns that lockdown has given us all more time whether we realize it or not because it's been a complete change in the not traveling all sorts of things i have chosen this time to learn to have deeper conversations with strangers again and you know um that book permission marketing that seth godin wrote i read 23 years ago turned stranger into friends and friends into customers and and it's very true um that he wrote that sort of not around the internet and then i wrote my book know me like me follow me which was sort of turning strangers and friends friends into followers but you know i i'm now you know i use linkedin to have conversations with people and i don't come onto that conversation thinking i've got to close the sale but i'm creating a very rich experience of learning and meeting a lot of really diverse wonderful people so I think that we have to learn, you know, these are conversation machines. Every single social network has got an ability to have a direct message now, doesn't it? Every Twitter has, um, LinkedIn has, Facebook, you know, everyone, you can direct message someone. And I think the more you do that, the richer your life will be. And not do it in a spammy way, but just in a genuine, just having a conversation. A lot of people will avoid it. But I think if just one or two of us reach out and have conversations with more people, um, then then we'll, we'll get it'll be a kinder place if you do it from your heart. Um, but that again sounds ridiculous. And what we're proving in BIP 100 and we proved in in Academy was actually when you take care of a few people and people trust you, transactions happen anyway. 
Yeah, because the, the buying from that feeling of being real, that you're, they know that they can trust you. And, and that's the biggest selling skill I think you can ever have is getting recommendations, but building a proper relationship with someone so they actually can help you and say, actually, this can't help you or this can help you. And that's that's essentially how I built my business is that if if I'm good at what I do, I will get a recommendation and I, I, I get out there. And, and also, I think it's really important as well that, that you get your story across to people as well. Hence why I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. Hence why I'm here, because it's really important for people to hear the way I think and the way I do things. And if people want to asynchronously listen to me and build a relationship with me so I don't have to talk to everyone that you know because i don't have time to do that for, with everyone but they could then engage with me and then yeah. we can talk and discuss um offline whenever they feel they, they they've got that message and yeah. i think that's 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 how i'm using technology yeah that's, that's how good. i'm making it more personal yeah i like that i like that a lot and the people you interview and the way you interview and the conversations you have with them and you're creating a normality around people, which is really nice. Because if we all feel we can be open, we understand we're quite normal and it's easier to become exceptional if you know you're normal. If you feel your emotions, your thoughts and what's going on in your head is subnormal, you've got to come through the line of normal to get to exceptional, if you see what I mean. So, and, and, and I think it is interesting with Clubhouse, obviously like any of these networks, some people are using them wrongly. But, you know, it's in real time conversation and people are listening to one another and sharing. And, there's, and the fact that it's just become so successful, um, you know, indicates that's what people want to be listened to and to be heard. Um, and the fact you don't have to uh, look all pretty <laughs> and put a shirt on. <laughs> um, um, so. But you know what's interesting, and I know your world is about technology. It's then interesting to know where is this heading. Because I know you did an interview with Thomas on you know future and technology. You know how where is it heading to, and how do we play in that very different world when AI and technology? And I think Thomas was telling me that they said by twenty. Oh God, what was he said he heard on the radio this morning? By twenty thirty or twenty that, 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 that quite soon anyway. 95 percent of video creation is going to be all ai oh yeah deep fake technology where the the person is basically made by a robot yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's no need for actors then there's no need yeah. for that whole creative industry um and i think the only thing that they probably won't take away is the voice like the voice is still quite personal and it's quite difficult for a robot to have that up flicks and down flicks and that personality when you come from a voice and then hence why listening um platforms like clubhouse are really going to take off exactly. but yeah really really interesting like where where is it going to go in my eyes well i think it's going to become quite tribal um in, in terms of facebook and that's what the downfall it's almost like a utopia and a dystopia all at the same time where where you've got tribes of people who are so polar from another tribe of people and there's no love between them and that's what's happened in america and that's what happened when donald trump took power right so it's it's really important that we see the dangers of being polar um civil wars happen because people have got polaring views and they are in this eternal feedback loop when it comes to social media yeah, well, they're in an echo chamber of just everything's being confirmed back to them, aren't they? And it's 100%. It's very, very, very dangerous that. And it is, you know, already know, I already know there's three subjects that I don't ask anyone at the moment. You know, one is Brexit, which did you vote? That's too divisive. The other is, are you having a vaccine or not? Yeah. And the other one is, did you watch the Meghan and Harry interview? <laughs> Because they're all things that people are very hot under the collar about, and um, it's very terrifying. And, and and a lot of us don't do our own research enough to form an opinion. We're just taking on other people's opinions all the time. Yeah, hundred percent. They're not. The, the power of debate is definitely lost because there's too much information out there. You, we, we get bombarded by too many 
um, mm. points of information that we we are losing the ability to dive into something and form our own opinions. Uh, that's something I think really deeply about and something that could go on beyond this podcast. Yeah. Um, so because I, I think it's so important uh, the way we just are a reflection of the stuff we consume as humans anyway. And so if we don't think about that, then if we don't think about the things that we are consuming, then, you know, that could be quite scary in terms of what Absolutely. we're portraying to the world. Our thoughts are not necessarily our own thoughts and we yeah. are being brainwashed, which is very uh, conspiracy theory. Um, but that's that's how it feels at the moment. No, but no, anyway, absolutely. anyway, right. let, let's move on to our... Um, your quick wins when it comes to making business personal, because obviously you got this great book, which I have here. Um, so if a business owner was listening to this uh, podcast, what's the top three things that you would recommend to make business personal? Well, it starts with um, really investing in some self-awareness about yourself and really thinking about, and, I, and people think, I used to think that was terribly indulgent, you know, what are your values and how are you taking care of yourself and really understanding your character and your personality. Um, it's, it's the journey I took myself on and, you know, I was 53 when I went on that journey I, and I'd love to have done it earlier in my life. I think my choices and some of the outcomes of things that I've done would have been very different um, <clears throat> so I would say you know that's a very quick win is and it'll take quite, you, you quite a while to do it but is really understand yourself and what's and, and it can start off literally with a piece of paper on your desk writing down the moments that you're happy and the moments that you're not the triggers that, that trigger anxiety or stress the people that warm you and make you feel happy and the people that are drains in your life you know there are some very you could literally do that just on your desk and and it's very interesting when you do that because you start to define things so there was a lovely interview jack ma interview with elon musk and jack ma just did this real throwaway comment and i wrote it down i've used it as a quote a lot which is a clever man knows what he wants a wise man knows what he doesn't want and i think that's sometimes the benefit of age is that I've become very aware of what I don't want and the people I don't want and the things that I aren't right for me in my life. I think you try and fit in a lot when you're younger. I need to fit in, I need to fit in, I need to expand, I need to, um, but you, if you do those things on your desk, you start to realize I do want that, I don't want that and start to have that courage to change things. And then, you know, that word courage is very impo important because a lot of us resist change. Um, we fear uncertainty, but there is something in us all where we have to, and I've had to do that, embrace change and be excited by uncertainty. And if you hear this and you fear change and you are somebody who requires certainty, I would say those are two areas of your character that you need to start to work on and I had to do it and I did a test three years ago online and I was driven by certainty and um, I did it again three years later fairly recently and I now have moved from that into loving uncertainty and I think we can change our character I don't think any of us should ever change our personality but we can change and learn from our character about where We've resisted things and and go into that growth mindset, um, which is a great book to read, by the way, by Carol Dweck. Yeah. And so, in terms of your other quick wins, um, <laughs> that was very quick, was it? No, no, that was a big one. Um, in terms of the other two, maybe a bit shorter. <laughs> well, I suppose I just gave them all in one go, didn't I? I did. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, but I, another quick win would be to start, this is a fun one, is start noticing your happy moments in your day. Yeah. Literally start saying this is a happy moment. I have seven, my cup of tea, I walk in the morning, my first coffee, you know, I have a number of things and I call it a happy moment and I register it in my brain as a happy moment. So that at the end of the day, whatever's happened, I know I've had seven happy moments. All right. Yeah, 100%. And your last one? And the last one. Um, I would say go into, find a small community around you, build one or go and find one. 
start realizing that small is beautiful and allow yourself to open up find somewhere where you have permission to just be really in your truth and that doesn't mean being highly vulnerable or sharing all your crap with other people it just means go somewhere where you are not ever having to pretend and build something around you like that or join something like that great thank you and how can let people learn more about making business personal what resources are available for them to, to go and do that well, there's my book, which you very kindly have mentioned, which is actually on Audible as well. Um, I went into a studio for 27 hours to record that. So it's seven and a half hours. So you, I, it was a lot of, could you redo that? I, I wanted to slap the sound engineer, but he was absolutely right. Got it right. Um, so there's my book. Then on my website, pennypower.co.uk, I've got a health check, which is free, and it's 42 yes, no questions. It's only take five minutes, but it churns out a report. It might get you thinking a little bit more holistically about yourself. Um, and then I, you can follow me, Penny Power, on, on all the networks and get in touch. And that was my last one was how can people connect with you? And that's obviously how they can. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. It'd be lovely to hear from anyone that's listened to this. And um, it's really nice. Thank you, Chris. I've really enjoyed this lunchtime with you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Thank you for coming on. You can tell Penny has prevailed from some of those bumps in the road that she's had. It's a great story. But what did you think of Penny's quick wins? Quick win number one, invest your time into finding out about your values, how you take care of yourself and understanding your character. And you could do that by writing down a list of the things or people that make you feel happy or unhappy, motivated or stressed, and also have the courage to embrace change. Quick win number two, start noticing your happy moments throughout your day. And quick win number three, surround yourself with a small community where you never have to pretend. Either find one or build one. But what was your favorite bit of this show? You can tell me on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, where you can find me with at hair digital. Remember, there are several other podcasts available to listen to, which you can find on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And whilst you're there, I'd be so grateful if you could subscribe and write a review. But until next time, I'm your Quick Win CEO, signing out.